operation. It would be very terrible if the Saudis had democracy and the United States couldn't go to the king and hit, hit him up for money for covert operations that the US Congress didn't feel like supporting. And they also got support from apartheid South Africa. Now, the administration secretly traded guns for hostages with Iran, then fighting Iraq, which was also being more heavily supported by the United States, and diverted some of this money to the illegal pro-contra enterprise, it was called, run from the National Security Council with active duty and lots of nominally retired CIA and military officers. All these private people had names like retired Colonel so-and-so and retired General General Secord and so on. The Iran-Contra hearing should have led to the impeachment of Ronald Reagan, President, and then Vice President, George Bush. But two presidential ousters in two decades were seen as too many. So instead, they beat around the bush. <laughs> that, was, that was really the name of the game. It was, we don't want to impeach Reagan, we don't want to impeach Bush, therefore we have to cover up everything that might possibly lead to that or pretend that what we've just heard doesn't happen. I mean, here you have a situation in which they go, okay, the fall guys are Oliver North and John Poindexter, and everybody goes, okay, we'll take them, that's nice. And not only that, we'll pay them lots of money to go on the speaking circuit later. Congressional overseers literally helped wipe fingerprints off smoking guns implicating Bush, a former CIA director. And again, I'm not going to go into this, but I do want to share with you one of these smoking guns. Two of them, actually, because there are two memos. April and May 1986, a time when the congressional prohibition of contra-military aid was still in force. The purpose of these, uh, the memo stated that the purpose that, of a meeting that Bush was going to have with Contra Air Supply Manager Felix Rodriguez was to, quote, brief the Vice President on the status of the war in El Salvador and resupply of the Contras. That's really ambiguous, right? Well, Bush aides told Congress when they testified during Iran-Contra hearings, they said, oh, the Secretary who typed that memo must have made that up. <laughs> and Congress said, oh, okay. Well, later, when Donald Gregg, a CIA veteran who was Bush's vice presidential national security advisor, appeared before Congress, he had to go back in confirmation hearings for his appointment as ambassador to South Korea. Gregg was questioned again about these memos, and he used a different excuse. He said, well, the secretary didn't make it up. She meant to type resupply of the copters to El Salvador. Literally, that's what he said. I mean, imagine him sitting there going, Contras, let's see, seven letters. <laughs> Copters, seven letters, sounds good. He couldn't use resupply of the cocaine, that would be a little too close to the truth. <laughs> but Congress people said, you know, they, they again, what they do, they, they confirmed Greg. Recently, just recently, in March, the Boston Globe reported that the Iran-Contra special prosecutor, this Lawrence Walsh, he's still there, he's still there, is deciding whether to indict Greg for lying about the Contra operation. And the article recounts the April 30 memorandum to Bush, that's the one they used about briefing the vice president. And, and in the, the reporter writes, at Greg's confirmation hearing, Senator Alan Cranston, a California Democrat, called the document a smoking gun that indicates Greg misled Congress. Nowhere does the article mention make the point that if the memorandum or any other aspect of Greg's role implicates Greg, it implicates Bush. The purpose of the meeting wasn't to brief Greg. It was to brief Bush. But you know, that's, that's how it goes. You can report this, but not really report it. And who's getting impeached? Alan Cranston makes a lot of sense in the SNL scandal. Well, scandals now come and go with about as much lasting impact as the TV movies they become. Yesterday's news becomes bankable stardom or ancient history. Celebrity fall guy Oliver North is showing crime pays of $25,000 a speech. Even North's secretary, Fawn Hall, cashed in. I used to imagine her giving speeches around the country. She won an award from the National Secretary's Association, or one of them, a Secretary of the Year Award. And I said, what did she do? She gave, she gave a speech title, The Modern Secretary's Motto, Better Shred Than Red. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, instead of accountability, there's absurdity, total absurdity. 
In the words of former CIA analyst David McMichael, who spoke here, Congress is dealing with the Iran-Contra violations by making them legal. Occasional notes of truth are lost in the continuous music of disinformation. During the 1984 campaign, Bush's press secretary told reporters this, following Bush's debate with uh, Democratic vice presidential candidate Jerry Ferraro, or Geraldine Ferraro, for those people who have already forgotten who she was. He said, you can say anything you want in debate, and 80 million people hear it. If reporters then document that a candidate spoke untruthfully, so what? Maybe 200 people read it, or 2,000, or 20,000. This is Bush's press secretary. So what? Of course, these words flash across the teleprompters whenever Bush speaks, but you're not going to see that. Let me just go back to Nicaragua briefly, talk about the National Endowment for Democracy. Destabilization campaigns, and I think this is very important to understand about U.S. policy now, today can culminate in invasions like Grenada 1983, or military coups like Guatemala 54 and Chile 1973, or electoral coups like Jamaica 1980 and Nicaragua 1990. Early in the 20th century, Nicaraguan elections were orchestrated by the State Department and U.S. Marines. Today, the main manipulators are the CIA, the National Endowment for Democracy, and an interlocking set of pseudo-private front organizations. I can't get into that, but it's beautiful to talk about all the front organizations they use. NED was established, the National Endowment for Democracy, was established in 1983 as the public arm of what the Reagan administration called Project Democracy. This mixed covert overt intervention and propaganda operation coordinated by the National Security Council. The NED is called a non-profit private organization, even though it's funded with tax dollars by Congress largely through the United States Information Agency and the Agency for International Development. Under Reagan, NED was supervised by someone named Walter Raymond, Jr. He's a CIA propaganda specialist who was first detailed to the National Security Council in 1982 as chief of the Intelligence Directorate. He then officially resigned from the CIA in 1983 in order to become director of International Communications and Public Diplomacy the polite word for propaganda, at the National Security Council. He later became Deputy Director of the U.S. Information Agency and is now the Intergovernmental Coordinator for Journalism in Eastern Europe, teaching them free press CIA style. So I mentioned Raymond because he's a very good guy to look at for the intersection of the covert and overt arms of U.S. policy. Nicaragua was really ripe for this electoral coup in which the NED role complemented continuing tactics of contra-attacks and economic embargo. By the time Nicaraguans went to vote last year, there was about $17 billion in war-related economic damage. Washington insists that Iraq pay reparations to Kuwait, but refuses to follow the World Court order to pay reparations to Nicaraguans, and instead is pressuring the Chamorro government to drop the World Court case. 30,000 Nicaraguans died in the Contra War out of a population of three and a half million. That's a figure comparable to over two million dead in the United States. Unfortunately, though, many people persist in using the Pentagon's tranquilizing euphemism for counter-revolutionary war for Central America and other parts of the Third World, they call it low-intensity conflict, figuring if they call it that, everybody would fall asleep. At the March 1990 NED board meeting, President Carl Gershman, the former senior counsel to UN Ambassador Jean Kirkpatrick, called the, quote, victory of the Democratic opposition in Nicaragua a tremendous victory for the endowment as well. Now imagine for a minute the leaders of the Soviet endowment for perestroika, or even the Swedish endowment for social democracy, claiming victory in the 1992 US elections. A presidential candidate with foreign funding is unthinkable politically in the United States and legally because U.S. law light rightly prohibits foreign funding of U.S. candidates. I don't know, it's kind of a strange idea. This idea that people shouldn't get support from foreign countries running for president or anything else. But Americans are so good at democracy and doublethink, they get to participate or we get to participate in the supposed democratic elections of other countries. Since I mentioned Jean Kirkpatrick's name, I'll just share with you an old cartoon that 
Dan Wasserman from the Boston Globe on the Better Cartoonist today did. It's because I like every opportunity to bring it up. In the cartoon, Gene Kirkpatrick says, what's the difference between totalitarian and authoritarian? Gene had this idea there was a difference between them and we could support authoritarian governments and we couldn't support totalitarian ones which were common. And she answers in the cartoon, well, a totalitarian government arrests, tortures, and murders. An authoritarian government, on the other hand, leaves many of these functions to the private sector. <laughs> Probably just using a set of Dan Wasserman's cartoons would be better history than most people get <laughs> in school. So the National Endowment for Democracy is busy making the world safe for democracy. Instead of enthusiastic support from liberals and conservatives alike, there should be public outrage. There isn't yet. At the June 1990 NED board meeting, a member commented on the small number of programs in the Middle East and noted that the Islamic world may offer future opportunities for increased activity. So we can look someday for the NED perhaps to help create a Kuwaiti democracy safe for the ruling Sabah family. That's if US officials change their minds and decide that Arabs are quote unquote ready for democracy. They go around saying, well, I don't know if we have to pressure Kuwait for democracy now. Arabs, they're, they're not really ready. Well, after democracy's so-called victory, the recolonized are left to exploitation without fanfare. Nicaragua had only to look at Panama to see there would be no post-election bailout. Panama had only to look at Grenada. With a population of 110,000, the size of an island the size of Martha's Vineyard, some of you who may know that off Massachusetts, I'm not sure what it's compared to in Iowa. What? Less than Iowa. <laughs> well, Grenada was the perfect place for creating kind of a low-cost theme park of corporate co-optation. You know, they could have tours there. Come see Grenada after the invasion. Everybody lives happy, you know. Instead, Grenada, like Panama and Nicaragua, saw hollow promises and declining living standards. Well, let me turn just a little bit to the United States and wrap up. Post-Cold War America, to what's going on here at home, that is. Post-Cold War America is being forged in cold cash, cold steel, and cold blood. Americans are endangered, and I think that we really have to understand this by our government's policies at home and abroad. President Bush told last year's World Summit for Children, he said, I've learned that our children are a mirror, an honest reflection of their parents and their world. Well, if the US government were a parent, it would be guilty of child abuse. American children are dying because ours is the only industrialized nation besides South Africa without national health care protection. The United States has the world's number one military and economy, but lags in measures of human decency. Americans rank only 22nd in infant mortality and child mortality under age five behind countries such as Singapore and the former East Germany. East Harlem has a higher child mortality rate than Bangladesh. The United States is really the poorest, richest country in the world. Even by the government's understated figures, one out of four, nearly one out of four children under six years old are growing up poor. That's the highest rate of any industrialized nation and it includes 17% of white children, 40% of Latino children, and almost half of all black children. One out of eight children under 12 are going hungry each day in this country. And another six million live in families that are at risk of being hungry, according to the Washington-based Food Research and Action Center. Many of these families are working poor in a country in which a full-time minimum wage guarantees you only poverty wages. Education, like health care, is rationed by income. State university systems are being decimated around the country. And rising numbers of young people do not have equal opportunity except to be all they can be in the army. As I said earlier, on the front lines in the Gulf, blacks and other minorities made up one third of US army troops. Nearly half of all women soldiers who served in the Gulf are black. On the home front, what is it? In some areas of the country, these are the words of a Federal Center for Disease Control report. In some areas of the country, it's now more likely for a black male between his 15th and 25th birthday to die from homicide than it was for a United States soldier to be killed on a tour of duty in Vietnam. 
and that's far truer for the Gulf War. In this new American order, more teenage boys of all races die from gunshots now than all natural causes combined. 1991 Senate Judiciary Committee report calls the United States, quote, the most violent and self-destructive nation on earth. More than 23,000 people killed last year. They say that the, in 1990, the United States led the world with its murder rape and robbery rates. It noted that the US murder rate was more than twice that of Northern Ireland and nine times that of England. Rates for violence against women were even worse. Again, according to the Judiciary Committee, the US rape rate was eight times higher than in France, 15 times higher than England, 23 times higher than Italy, and 26 times higher than in Japan, and it's been going up this year. And there's surveys done, this is a college campus, so I should just repeat this, surveys done of uh, uh, men on college campuses in, in college, students asking, would you commit rape if you thought you could get away with it? And the surveys show one out of three or one out of four, depending on the survey, men saying yes. The problem isn't lack of prisons, but toleration of racism and violence against women and lack of opportunity, rehabilitation, lack of drug addiction treatment, jobs, education, and so on. The US already has the world's highest imprisonment rate, higher than South Africa, higher than the Soviet Union, higher than everywhere else. And the American rate will probably go up with people convicted with Supreme Court blessing after they have confessions beaten out of them. It costs $29,000 a year to keep someone in US prison. Average American annual pay is less than $23,000. In many neighborhoods, it's easier now to buy a gun than to register to vote. So I say the American dream is dying a slow death, even for those who thought they had a piece of it. Living standards are falling for younger generations for the first time since the Civil War. Average workers' wages are in a long-term depression, dropping 17% after correcting for inflation since 1973. The dream of home ownership is fading with the 20th century, and homelessness has become so visible it rouses little attention. But wealth is not evaporating. It's being concentrated in fewer hands. I recommend to you a book called The Politics of Rich and Poor by one of the conservatives' leading political strategists, Kevin Phillips. One of the most honest books about politics of rich and poor. He writes in that book, the 1980s were the triumph of upper America, an ostentatious celebration of wealth. According to Business Week, the average chief, chief executive officer, or CEO, earned as much as 41 factory workers or 38 teachers in 1960. By 1988, the CEO earned as much as 93 factory workers or 72 teachers. That year, the average CEO's total compensation climbed to over $2 million, <coughs> far outpacing counterparts in Europe and Japan. Meanwhile, though, the top tax rate plummeted from a marginal rate of 91% in 1964 to 28% today, the lowest among industrialized nations. You know, they make more, but they have to pay less. It makes a lot of sense, right? As budget deficits swell, in large part, not in large part, yes, because of the military buildup, but also because of the tax giveaways, the tax giveaways of the last decade and even before that. As budget deficits swell, federal, state, and local governments cut deeper into education, housing, healthcare, mass transit, and other essential services in what's really an unwinnable race, completely unwinnable, to keep up with tax giveaways, gold plated military contracts, and of course the speculate and loot banking bailout. And what does Washington do with money? It eagerly finds money to send troops abroad but offers them yellow ribbons in a competition with children and non-veterans for decaying social services when they get home. That's what they told Congress. You know you want to give more money to the vets, but take it out of these other line items. The collateral damage of global militarism is enormous. Each day, 40,000 children die, each day for malnutrition, lack of clean water, and disease. Their deaths, like many adult deaths, are completely preventable with the shift in government priorities. So the Gulf War should not provide an excuse, like it is now, for new high-tech arms races 
but an urgent mandate for curtailing the global weapons trade, strengthening diplomacy, and achieving economic and environmental security. Bush's new American century promises to be one of high technology and low morality, smart bombs and dumb policies. In the view of, uh, again, Dan Wasserman talking about youth of the 90s or drawing youth of the 90s in one of his cartoons he's got, Sosuke from Japan, computer genius, Helga, engineering whiz, in Germany. From the United States, there's Bob, smart bomber. Well, we can, I think, imagine a different world order. Imagine a world order made safe not for all-out military force, to use Newsweek's words, but safe for all-out smart diplomacy, disarmament, and international law. In a real new world order, the United Nations wouldn't serve the cause of international peacekeeping, would serve the cause of international peacekeeping, not selective US-directed policekeeping. Imagine a world order safe for human rights and not hypocrisy, and human rights in their fullest sense, as defined as long ago in, as 1948 by the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, in which they said everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and of his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care, and necessary social services. Imagine all the Congress people who waved flags and wore big yellow buttons to cheerlead Bush's televised New World Order victory speech. Some of you may have saw that. So, uh, a congressional aide said they looked like 500 flower arrangements. Cheering Bush. Imagine them working hard for a just domestic order. Imagine a Congress truly representative of the American people, more than half female, with an ethnic and racial mix more like the Army's ground troops than the corporate boardroom. We need to endow democracy at home with universal voter registration, free media for in-depth debate among diverse candidates, and public financing for all campaigns at the state, local, and federal level. Imagine the United States upbeat over its educational progress, proud of rapid mobilization to sustain the environment, and euphoric over an end to unemployment and poverty. If we can't imagine that just new order, we'll never get there. If we can't think big, if we can't think big, we'll really always be marginalized in both our ideas and policies. So I think we need to think very big about not just protesting these policies that be, but changing who is making the policy. Thank you. I know that went on for a long time, but you know, I'm the only one up here, so. <laughs> I know you write for an alternative uh, news magazine. One of the things that was most distressing about the war was the fact that the media, there was no discussion after uh, bombing began and only a very moderate amount uh, when they were discussing the uh, Senate was debating uh, sanctions and so forth. Do you see any way of cutting into I think there's all sorts of ways. I mean, one way is to, to use and share and promote and so on some alternative sources of media, whether it's magazines or uh, television. There's cab cable television, for example, radio, and so on. But I think it's also very important to think about better using the space in the media, the mass media, the one that reaches, reaches already millions and millions of people, using that space that's already there. The media, I like to say, is, is biased, and that's no surprise. It's biased in the direction of those who own the media. One way you get around that bias is you try and demand, for example, when it comes to elections, you try and demand free media for all candidates for serious debate, not these kind of strange circuses that they put on now and call debates. So you can legislate some of that in terms of equal time and so on. 
But another thing that I think that has to be done by progressives in the way that the right wing does is to very systematically work the media. That is, it's not enough to say, where's my, you know, how come I'm not up there? Or where's someone representing my view? Or send out a press release when you have an event. That's not what the right wing or anyone else does for the most part. You have to systematically, especially in an age of information overload and expert and think tank and, you know, every retired military official is an expert overload. I mean, there's no shortage of people to put on right now um, to, to uh, you know, they're inundated essentially, usually with people. I mean, so then you ask yourself, well, how come they only end up with the same five ones? That's <laughs> another story. But anyway, they systematically promote events, spokespeople, and so on. And that means, again, having systematic media campaigns as part of all all educational and political campaigns to think again, think big. And so you say, I'm going to approach not just my local alternative radio station, if I've got some event or person to promote, but talk shows on the AM and FM dial that are not alternative, but that have people on the, all the time, and especially uh, in cities outside of Washington, for example, or Boston, New York, some of the, even Boston, it's, it's much easier than New York or Washington. Where they have, they're trying to fill space all the time with people. You can, you can get on talk shows in most places around the country, some of the very big talk shows, with alternative views. And you know when you're on those shows, you're talking to very large audiences and audiences that are pretty attentive. They follow these talk shows, you know, it's their audience. And they also get, often get, they're often call in shows and you can have interesting dialogue with people back and forth. So it's the working the talk show circuit as well as television. It's not enough to just send your whatever in, but you've got to have somebody who's systematically trying to book your people. Call the booker. That's what they're called, you know, at the talk show and say, here's these people, here's their credentials, put them on, and then follow up, and follow up again, and eventually it breaks through. Same thing with op-eds. You may not get your first op-ed in X newspaper that you try, especially if the first one you try is the New York Times, you're not likely to get it in. But if you send out op-eds to lots of newspapers, especially starting with your local one, you are occasionally going to get an op-ed in, and, and if what you are is a writer, likely to build a reputation and get more. It can be done. I think there's a lot of kind of self-limiting that goes on. People used to thinking there's the big media and then the mass media, and they're all biased, and, and there's the alternative media, and not, I think, thinking like we should, that we need to work both all the time, systematically. And think even bigger, it would be nice to owning shows. It used to be a lot cheaper to buy cable <laughs> than it is now. It was too bad that people didn't think like Ted Turner and many of the um, right-wing evangelicals and others when they bought up a lot of things, stations, when it was much cheaper to do so. But even now, there's still room for literally owning different kind of views uh, represented through ownership in the media. Um, I should explain what it is first for, for most people who don't know what it is. But before I do, to say that I don't think Jimmy Carter's sort of being back in the news is probably a reflection of that. He's been pretty disconnected from the Trilateral Commission since leaving office. And it's kind of changed his policies in a lot of ways that some people are wont to do when they leave office where they could have made a difference, then they start <laughs> being better once they're retired. Um, but the Trilateral Commission was started in 1973 by corporate executives, bankers, um, past and future politicians, media executives, by, from the United States, from Canada, calling themselves North America, Europe, Western Europe, and Japan, hence trilateral, three-sided, came together following other kinds of elite planning organizations that have existed, like the Council on Foreign Relations, which still exists but only includes U.S. people, or the Atlantic Council, for example, which includes European and U.S. people, 
This one was different because it added Japan, recognizing the rising importance of Japan in the world. And what it essentially was is a place where people can come together for um, people who tend to have the mindset of multinational corporations looking out on the world and seeing it as their farm, factory, supermarket, playground, trying to figure out how to best exploit that world. Come together to try and achieve coherence and consensus amongst themselves. At the time they were formed, there was a real um, fear that Japan, with the rise in power of Japan and uh, Germany, that you'd go back to a kind of World War I one situation of increased protectionism and nationalism and the capitalist powers fighting with each other, and the trilateralists didn't want that. They wanted to come up with a scheme of what they called uh, interdependence and collective management. They quickly got into trying to figure out how to work together to deal with things like Vietnam and the national liberation struggles in places like Angola. Philippines and elsewhere around the world, Nicaragua, Iran, and so on. They had, they had a couple basic ideas that are pretty significant for today. One was they always believed in the importance of reintegrating those that they called the dropouts into the world economy, the Soviet Union and China. They really believed through co-optation and the idea that, they believed in the idea that eventually the Chinese and the Soviets would say, if you can't beat them, join them. And that's essentially what's happened. And I think trilateralists uh, can give themselves and do take a lot of credit, pat themselves on the back for that, um, for moderating, for example, the Reagan policies, especially toward the end. And the other idea they pushed very strongly was the idea of united Europe, that the way for Europe to best function was as a united bloc. And of course, in 92, Europe is scheduled to be officially United Europe. And they also believed heavily in ideas like uh, co-optation of those third world countries that they considered kind of middle class countries and work with them through them to, to help keep all the other poor countries in line. And so they looked at organizations like the OPEC and Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, especially Saudi Arabia, and said, well, the thing to do isn't really to just smash OPEC. What we're going to do is co-opt OPEC, and we're going to get them when they make all this new money, these petrodollars, it was called. That'll work to our advantage. All the oil prices will go up, which doesn't hurt US oil companies or the British or whatever. And the petrodollars will be recycled, invested in the United States, invested in Europe and elsewhere. And when they build in Saudi Arabia or Kuwait or whatever, who are they going to use? Bechtel Corporation and other corporations from the West. So in the end, the money didn't go to the advantage of most Arabs. It went, again, right back into the boxes of multinational corporations, shoring up the US debt and things like that. And sometimes, occasionally, it went into covert operations that the US was doing against Angola or whoever, Libya, whoever. Um, so I think it's a really interesting time for trilateralism now, because they formed originally to, to keep themselves from splitting apart and fighting with each other, both economically and potentially, then the economic competition leading to military competition again. Um, and to keep themselves more than together, but as, again, collective managers of the rest of the world, so they'd be this united force. And until the Gulf War, you could say it looked like all their dreams were really coming true. Soviet Union basically says, oh, Cold War, we quit, you won. Um, and reintegration of Eastern Europe, multinational corporations running over there to get you know, a whole new cheap labor force and so on. Um, the Gulf War, kind of the US policy in the Gulf War, was the contradictions of all of this coming out. Where I think you have the United States government, the Bush administration, wanting to now redefine, Bush used to be a member of the Trilateral Commission when you become president or something, you go off the commission and then you get listed in a category of their membership called former members now in public service. So you can always read that and see who used to be on, but they're not officially on while they're in public service. And um, so you have contradictions now because the Bush administration wants to essentially define trilateralism still as United States leads and the others follow and help us do the bombing or the 
international monetary fund arm twisting or whatever it is. But it's, a, it's an interesting situation where what the US basically said, I think, aside from uh, to uh, Britain, which was very happy to go along, said either you join us in this kind of total warfare approach to the Gulf situation, a non-negotiated approach, or we do it anyway and then you lose out because you're not going to get any of the contracts and rebuilding Kuwait and you're going to, uh, the American people are going to be very upset even more than they are now with Germany and Japan. And I think Japan always has a lot to rightly fear in terms of how easy it is to sort of raise the new yellow peril, quote unquote, you know, here in the United States against Japan on the basis of racism, use economic nationalism. You know, we won't buy your Toyotas and we'll beat up Chinese people and kill them because they look Japanese and stuff, that goes on. Um, easier to do that against Japan than Germany. Um, so the United States basically saying, we're still number one, even though the reason we were number one, which was the competition with the Soviet Union, is supposedly over, right? So they found this new way to kind of impose themselves as the more equal than equal partner. But what's going to happen in the long run, or even in the medium run, is going to be interesting to see because it's contradictory because true trilateralism is an acknowledgement that the United States is not, in the long run, number one, that there's no country will be number one, rather you have this kind of alliance, collective management. And I think it's always contradictory, each, not just for the United States, but German leadership or Japanese leadership and others, always contradiction between what's in their immediate national interest and what's in their kind of longer run international corporate interest, just like with multinational corporations. There's all, all, often a conflict between what's in their short run interest, perhaps and in their long run interest in terms of strategy. So I think they're trilateralists now that are trying to play this kind of role still of now in this period of incredible transition, the building of the so-called New World Order, figuring out how to be the glue that keeps, again, Japan, Germany in particular, when it comes to Europe, and the United States from dissolving into competition with each other. But it's going to be a very messy situation because all sorts of things are happening in Eastern Europe, which will challenge them in all sorts of ways again as workers find out that this idea they had of the wonders of capitalism wasn't exactly so wonderful, what are they gonna then do? As the Soviet Union is doing now, looking at the Gulf War, the Soviet Union doesn't look, some parts, especially the Soviet military, is looking at the Gulf War and going, uh-oh, <laughs> you know, the way to go is not to liberalize more, but to, not to liberalize more in the Soviet Union, but to essentially return to the old ways, reunify, and have another military buildup because if we had a war with the United States now, we'd be in big trouble, you know, the worry, at least short of nuclear power, which is hard to say short of nuclear power because any war between the Soviet Union and the U.S. would go nuclear, but I think probably the Soviets are saying to themselves, hmm, I bet the U.S. really could do a first strike that would devastate us before we could even retaliate. So, I mean, there's all sorts of things going up going on, uh, which will have a lot of effects. But again, you know, trilateralists trying to, trying to figure out what's a rational policy for themselves out of this. I'm looking for women. <laughs> Go ahead. There's several, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I always find it interesting. I mean, it's always true that women tend to ask less questions, and you always figure, well, if there's a woman speaker, then that would make people feel like it's, you know, okay, better, but even then, go ahead. <laughs> Um, list of two questions, right? <laughs> um, in the who's next category, um, I think it's probably pretty clear that Cubans are saying to themselves, uh, time to recheck the air defense systems, <laughs> etc. Um, because they're not going to come the way they did with the Bay of Pigs. 
the new way the United States will come is just, and, and this is you know, very important. I mean, and I think people should consider it and talk to people about it. The United States now feels like it has a license to just blow up a country. You know, the equivalent of, as long as you don't nuke them, although 45% of the American public says it's okay to nuke them too, according to that poll I mentioned. Um, if that's essentially what you feel like that you have a license to do, then it's a lot easier to think that any war with a third world country is winnable because, you know, what are they going to do? And so Cuba, I think, uh, should be very worried about the prospects, not of an invasion again in the old sense, but lots of bombers coming from a very short distance away, leading with the stealth, which is what they did in Iraq. You found out what the stealth bomber was for. The stealth bomber so much isn't when the stealth fighter, fighter bomber, this sort of two versions, isn't to get under cover of Soviet nuclear forces and drop nukes on the Soviet Union. What the stealth is really good for is getting to a country and knocking out their air raid systems and their air force headquarters and their other air defense systems so that then all the other bombers can come and bomb the country at will. That's what the stealth was really used for in Iraq. When it was used to knock out a military target like the, um, uh, was supposed to be used against Noriega's headquarters, or not Noriega's headquarters, I guess some other military target in Panama it didn't do so good, the bombs missed. But of course, they're always improving those things. Um, as everybody knows, with fax machines and personal computers, a lot of technology can improve in a year. Um, so at any rate, yes, Cuba very well could be a next country. El Salvador could be a next country if their negotiations there don't work and the FMLN, I don't believe this scenario will happen because I don't believe the FMLN, if the FMLN very much wants a negotiated settlement in El Salvador. If they didn't get one in this round of negotiations now going on, I still don't believe the FMLN at this point would move for a total, try and have a military overthrow of the government kind of march into San Salvador kind of thing. But if they did, if they threatened, the Salvadoran government. I think the U.S. clearly would respond militarily, and some of you may have heard that Colin Powell said as much in an interview in Honduras only recently. You know, of course, we're for a negotiated settlement, but if the negotiations don't work, Gulf War shows we can always take care of it by some other way. Um, and there are other countries, the Philippines potentially, if things there got quote unquote out of hand. Libya, maybe they'll go back and sort of take care of Libya again because now they've shown that more massive bombing will be tolerated and so on. So, I mean, I think the potential is bad all over, but in the category of next year, certainly Cuba could be. Um, and that says a lot for people who are starting to talk about that now. Um, the latter part of the question in terms of fascism in the United States, it was, right? Prospects. Um, depends probably on the day as to how I, how I feel about that, whether I'm sort of wearing my most pessimistic hat or my most optimistic hat. Um, but I believe that it's a very serious threat, not in the sense of sort of Hitler-style fascism, although even that is possible, because who would have thought that was possible in Germany right before it happened? Um, a lot of people say that, you know, uh, what's your name, Lenny uh, Reichenstag, is that how it's? Riefenstag. Triumph of the Will, the classic propaganda film, she's being a propagandist for Nazi Germany, has a lot to learn from some of what went on in the Gulf War in terms of propaganda. Um, I, I think there is a great capacity for authoritarian government here. I mean, we have authoritarian government in a lot of ways, not a fascist government by any means, but authoritarian in the sense that people for the most part take what's given to them as given. That's one of the hallmarks of it. There is the kind of equivalent of the Ministry of Truth in Washington and even more than that, what really fascinates me and why I read that Orwell quote in the beginning is, even if you, about double think is, at the same time as you, you can at the same time simultaneously, for example, say, uh, George Bush went to uh, liberate Kuwait and know that Kuwait wasn't a democratic country to begin with, but still in your mind think of it as democratic, that they liberated and made free. You can at the same time think of yourself, think of George Bush as sort of 
fighting aggression and saving people and liberating people at the same time knowing that what they really want is a military coup in Iraq to knock out Saddam Hussein because if there was, they don't want popular rebellion by Shias and Kurds because then they couldn't control that. At the same time, no, they really don't want democratic government in Saudi Arabia because that's not likely to be the kind of government they can just get whatever they want from. So you can sort of even simultaneously know both those things and that's very scary. Or simultaneously say, anybody comes who touches my oil, I'll blow them up. On the other hand, say, anybody who tries to control their own oil, I'll blow them up, you know. <laughs> or, we're not going to buy Japan's cars, but the nerve of those Japanese not to let our rice in, you know, you're going to do all those kinds of things and without even thinking there's kind of a slight problem in the logic there. Um, or, what I, something I said in the talk, which was, I mean, how many times did you hear how many versions of people saying, well, yes, people have a right to protest the war in the Gulf, but... They really should shut up because the boys over there, sometimes they say the boys and girls over there are defending their right to free speech. So they should shut up. <laughs> and they said that. I mean, you know, that would be a parody if it wasn't true. That's what people said in a lot of different ways. Without, again, even knowing that they were saying something strange. And without any of the reporters noticing that something strange was being said. So it's really quite worrisome. And that's Again, when I was sort of reading from Brave New World, that was the quote about making them love their slavery, you know, and not even noticing that their minds are <laughs> being enslaved. And so if you have a situation in which most people also have no access to alternative information, in which history is considered ancient, there was a um, kind of a great moment in the, was it the 80 campaign um, or the 84 campaign when Howard Baker was running for president? in the Republican primaries, and he was challenged by a uh, student at a university, at the University of Texas, an Iranian student, it might have been, must have been 80, who said, um, you know, how can you, uh, um, how can you uh, be so, you know, it's sort of in the context of how can you talk about being so against Iran now and criticizing the Khomeini regime, I've, sort of forget whether he's defending the Khomeini regime or not, or just simply making the point, how can you do all that knowing that the United States supported the Shah of Iran for all those years, who, who tortured, et cetera, et cetera. And what did Howard Baker say? He said, he said, I'm not interested in that. He said, that's ancient history, you know. I'm interested in American lives. You know, and that was like last year, you know. Um, but that's really kind of the reality of it now, is ancient history is yesterday. Weren't some of the uh, Gulf War protesters guilty of the same thing and that they sort of forgot fairly recent history uh, when they said, how could anyone think we're against the troops just because